So today, I want you to uh, follow me as we talk about things that we need to remember when we're sharing the gospel. What are the things that we need to remember when we are sharing the gospel? You know, that, that's a lot of things, but I want to pay particular attention to three things. Just to uh, help you, I'm going to call them the Trinitarian hints. Those are the three things, the three things that we need to remember, three things that will make us better evangelists, three things that will make us better evangelists for Jesus. You know, evangelism can be very, very, very complicated. Evangelism is sharing the gospel. Evangelism is is telling people how they can become Christians. I think that you all will agree with me that if you have not experienced a good food or meal in a restaurant, you cannot recommend other people to go there. Do we agree on that? If you have not tasted something, you cannot tell somebody whether it is sweet or bitter. Amen? Uh, there's absolutely nothing in the world that you can share convincingly if you have not put yourself in that thing. In other words, you have not fully experienced it. Amen? Amen? Can you teach somebody to swim if you've never been in the water? No? <laughs> Amen. You can read a book on swimming. But you won't be able to swim because you've read something on swimming. Are you all with me? You cannot tell how my rice and crab meal tastes unless you've experienced it. Right? Right. Now, I want to tell you this. It doesn't matter how many times I preach on evangelism. It doesn't matter how many books I recommend on evangelism. It doesn't matter how many seminars we give on evangelism. You cannot do it unless you yourself have been evangelized. That amen is so weak. Yeah, it's like many of you are not listening to me. Let me say that the reason why you're probably not evangelizing is because you have not been evangelized yourself. Amen. Going to church does not make you a Christian. Amen. These chairs that are in here are in this building. They sit here every time. It doesn't make them Christians. They're here longer than you are. They don't go anywhere. They don't become Christians because they come to, to this building. They stay in this building. Just like you are not a Christian because you come to church every Sunday. You're not a Christian because you go to Bible study. You're not a Christian because you sing the songs of Zion. Hallelujah. Don't be afraid to say amen now. There's going to be somebody next to you doesn't believe what I'm saying. And the only way you can witness to it is to say, Amen. Amen. All right. 
So this message is not for non-Christians. Three things that will make you a better evangelist. You are not an evangelist until you have been evangelized. In high school, I made the soccer team. We represented our school everywhere. We traveled everywhere. And uh, we were the first team in the history of Baptist Boys High School in Abelkota to get to the championship. I did not play one minute. Throughout the year. How many people can guess what position I was playing? How could it be possible that you did not play one minute all through the year? Yes? I was the goalie. Thank you. But I was not the first goalie, even though I was better than the first goalie. The reason why my coach said you are going to come off the bench is because you're too short. Immediately we put you in the goal, all the attempted goals will be lobbying. And if you are a goalie, you have to time when you jump. And if you jump at the wrong time, you will be coming down when the ball is going in. And nobody can teach you that. It happens automatically on the field of play. But you know what I can boast of? If you go and look at the picture of the team and look at the picture of the championship cup, you will see me as part of the team. If you came to practice, you will see me playing in the goal because I was actually part of the team. On the day of the game, I may not be able to do anything, but I am 100% ready to go in. If I were in the NFL, they'd be paying me millions of dollars just to sit on the bench because I made it. It doesn't matter what your educational level is. It doesn't matter what your uh, uh, spiritual level is. It doesn't matter anything about your qualification. What matters the most is that you have been qualified to be part of the team. And what makes you to be part of the evangelism team in the church of Jesus Christ? Having a relationship with God, having a relationship with Christ, having accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and following him. Follow me, and I will make you what? Fishers of men. All right. So I want to help you as fishers of men and women. I want to help you. What are the things that are going to help you? In fact, there are only three words. Oh, sorry. (laughs) Maybe I need to get my uh, thing there. Okay, there are three words that I'm going to share with you this morning. Okay, I'm going to let you know the words right away and we'll get to them. The first word is, if you, if you want to know how to witness what you should do, how you should share the gospel, the first word that you should know is the word repentance. The 
The second word that you should know if you're going to uh, share the gospel is holiness. I know we probably don't think about that. And the third word that you should know is the word grace. If you know and understand all those words, you will be a great evangelist. Let's look at the first word, repentance. This word is so important that Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, and the prophets before them in the Old Testament used the word repent. Now, before I get into it, let's read some scripture passages. We're going to read three of them. Let's look at Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the, the good news. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe the good news. Let's look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You with me? Let's read Matthew chapter 3. And verse 2. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. This is John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 2. In those days, John the baptizer came preaching in the desert of Judea, and saying what? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Let me tell you why many times we have a lot of people that we say we have witnessed to, but they have not come to Christ. Is in the word repentance. L. I repent. To repent means to change your mind. And in repentance, there is a change of mind that leads to what? A change in action, the way you behave. I remember when they used to, we didn't have a GPS then, long time ago. Some of you here probably don't believe that. 
Long time ago, there was no GPS. And if you were traveling, many times we're traveling from here to Tahoe to wherever we were going. And when we are lost, I have to get out of the car and literally go to a gas station. Or if I had enough sense before I left home, bought the map that shows me where I'm going, and I will keep looking at it. But today, you know, Nia, you guys don't know anything about that. Okay, you just get in the car, and the car is telling you where you should be going. Just think about this. What if you have that map and you went to the gas station and they told you where to go or you have the GPS in your car and it's telling you recuperating or whatever that is saying, saying you know, re- recalculating or whatever. You know, it wants you to tell you, say, I'll forget you. I'm still going here. That's what happens to a lot of people because we have presented the gospel without repentance. Repentance means you have to literally change the way you think. You can't act differently unless you believe differently. You guys are going to have a problem today because I'm not putting this, you know, uh, and there are probably some people cussing me out online now. <laughs> okay. It is important that we understand this is part and parcel of the gospel. Without it, it is not a gospel at all. I know the gospel is God, man, Jesus, accept. But in other words, you cannot accept until you've changed your mind. The reason why many people today cannot accept the gospel is because they still think they are numero uno. It's the way you think. It's the way you behave. It's what you want to do, not what God wants to do. Repent and believe the gospel. You have to change. You have to change. It's it's amazing how God honors repentance. There was a prophet named Jonah. God wanted to send him to this ungodly city. And he said, I've heard a lot about the people that ain't going there. God said, I want you to go to Nineveh. And God had a very short message. That message will not even take 10 minutes. It will not take five minutes. It's not as long as the message I'm giving to you right now. He said, I want you to go there. And the message I want you to preach is a sentence. After 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's all. Just go around Nineveh and share that gospel and tell them, after 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. But Jonah knew how God respected repentance. He didn't want to go. I know what you're going to do. If they change their mind and started going the way you want them to go, I know you're going to forgive them. That is how God respects repentance. Amen. You can say, I accept Jesus today, but I I still curse everybody along my way. Amen. I accept Jesus Christ, but I don't go to church. I accept Jesus Christ, but I don't read the word. I accept Jesus Christ, I don't pray. 
I said, Jesus Christ, I don't, I don't even want to change my ways. I'm going to talk about that when I get to grace. Because many of us have abused grace. Amen. Change your mind. If you change your mind, God is going to respect it and he's going to bless you and he's going to supply everything that you need to live a victorious life in this world. Repent. Amen. You have not repented if you keep going to that neighborhood. The neighborhood that got you frustrated. The neighborhood that made you an enemy of the kingdom, an enemy of Christ, an enemy of God. You keep going back there. I'm just a human being. Change your mind. Change your mind. Every time you change your mind, it will lead you to act differently. Oh, we don't want to tell the people that while you're giving them the gospel. Why am I going to mess it all up? Telling them they have to repent. The gospel is not complete until you tell people that they have to stop thinking the way they think and think the way God wants them to think. So you presented the gospel to someone and said, the Bible says you need to repent. Say, what does that mean? Start thinking God's way. Stop going your own way. Amen? Amen? Isn't it amazing that God loves you so much, he wrote you 66 letters. You can say, I don't, I don't know what he wants me to do. That's why so many of us, if I want to hide something, I put it in your Bible. Because you'll never find it. A true change of mind that leads to a change in actions. The gospel presentation must include this. It is a must. Repentance. Think about it. Holiness. Holiness is the second word. Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 15. I mean chapter 1 verses 15 through 17. And then I want to read all the scripture verses because I want to put them in, put them in context. We're going to read also Hebrews chapter 12 and uh, verses 14 and 14 through 16. And then we're going to read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. So 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 and 17. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. Are you with me? Who called you into the Christian faith? It was it the church? Was it your family? Who called you? The Holy Spirit. God called you into his kingdom. God invited you into his kingdom. When you now come into his kingdom, you have to obey the kingdom rules. And God say, I am holy and I want you to be what? Holy. Don't say, well, it is impossible. No, God, God doesn't give you impossible things. God will not tell you to obey your parents if it is impossible. God will not tell you, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse if it is impossible. You're not doing it because you don't want to. It's not because it's not possible. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 and 16. Verse 
verses 14 and 15. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be what? Holy. Without holiness, no one will see God. It's, it's, it's correct. You're just using a different translation. Do we get that? So is holiness going to be part of something you have in your mind when you're presenting the gospel? Yes. Because God is calling them to be holy. Now let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 10. For we are what? God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. How many people here believe they're not sinners? If you're not a sinner, raise your hand. You're not a sinner. Okay, so we are all sinners. Okay, don't, don't deny the next time because I asked you publicly and you said you are a sinner. If we are all holy and we are all sinners, how could that be? Because we have completely misunderstood what holiness is. That's why. God said, I am holy. Yes, he is clean. He is pure. He is righteous. He is just. But that's not primarily what he means by I am holy. When God says I am holy, he means I am set apart from any other God. I am set apart from any other thing. I am God by myself. You cannot compare me with Baal. You cannot compare me with Orisha. You cannot compare me with all these things because I am God by myself. I am set apart from everything. In the Old Testament, the things that were holy were put separately because they're used only to serve God. Amen? Amen. It's just like me getting mad if anybody is sitting on the communion table. Say, wait a minute. Get your... Get it off that table. That table is set aside only to be used for the service of our God. That table, that communion table is holy. It is set apart. You can't use it for something. You can't use it to count money. When you go into the temple and you see the holy utensils that are used for the service of God, you can't use it to do something like, oh, I'm thirsty, I want to drink. No. That is set apart for God. When God says be holy, God is saying set yourself apart to me. Amen. God, we are all sinners, but God is looking for a people that will be separated to him. People that will represent him. You're set apart only for him. It is not how clean you are, 
but how dedicated you are to a new way of life. Be ye holy, for I am holy. If you if you set apart for God, you set apart to His Word. You set apart to His people. You set apart to His way. I don't know. It's getting quiet in here. Holiness. God loves holiness. Holiness is when you are dedicated to him and you come just like you are. Just as I am without one plea, but that the blood was shed for me, I come to you. O Lamb of God, I come. So when you're witnessing to people, always have in your mind, God is looking for more people to join in the kingdom movement. He's enlisting more people because God has to have a witness on this earth and he needs more people to join in the army that are going to conquer the world, that are going to conquer the devil, that are going to conquer the enemy, that are going to conquer depression, that are going to conquer adultery, that are going to conquer all this because he wants you in the army. And he's bigger than Uncle Sam. He wants you. He wants to enlist you. Amen. Holiness and then grace. Grace. The word grace is really important. It's the Greek charis. The grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What has grace got to do with salvation? Without grace, you don't have salvation. Now, let me explain something real quickly. Grace is the Reason for salvation. Grace did not ascend to you when Jesus died on the cross. Grace was extended to you before Jesus died on the cross. Grace is the reason why Jesus died on the cross. Grace Is the unlimited mercy of God. Grace is God extending himself to us when we did not deserve it. You need to remember this when you're witnessing to people. Christianity is not legalism. You don't become a Christian because you're pure. You don't become a Christian because you tell the truth. You don't become a Christian because you don't steal. You don't become a Christian because you are a morally pure person. You become a Christian because of the grace of God. So grace is against legalism. Let me write that down for you. That's the one thing grace is against. So many times, many of us gauge our Christianity by the good things that we do. How many of the laws of God we obey? Do you know that it is possible for you to become a Christian without accepting Christ? It is possible. Yes. You can become a Christian by being perfect. Do 
don't sin at all. I'm not just talking about what you do, what you think, because what some of you are thinking right now is sin. <laughs> Paul said the law was given so that you know you can do it. So if you want to become a Christian by how nice you are and the things that come out of your mouth and all that you do, uh, uh, keep doing it. You're going to find yourself in hell. Grace is against legalism and grace is against antinomianism. Grace is against legalism. Amen? You don't come to God because of anything you've done. Grace is also against lawlessness. Antinomianism is against the law. I'm under grace. I don't have to do that. Have you ever heard that? Grace. Grace doesn't mean drink all you can. Hallelujah. Watch all you can. Grace is not Holding every time, First John one nine. Amen. I'm not saying First John one nine is not correct, but a lot of people do the thing that they're not supposed to do because First John one nine is there. That's antinomianism. It's a great theological lesson. We need to listen. Romans chapter 6, Paul said, we cannot say let grace, let's do anything we can so that grace may abound. Antinomianism. It doesn't mean we're perfect, but it doesn't mean we should do just anything we want. Grace. Grace, 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 grace. Grace is saying, now you are under the care of God. You are under the protection of God. You are under the love of God. You are under the righteousness of God. God extends everything to you, but God expects everything from you. Grace. Amazing grace. How sweet that sounds. That saved a wretch like me. I once was what? Lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now I see. N listen to the song, oh, because Grace did not say, I once was blind and I remain blind. I once was lost, but I remain lost. Miss Grace did something. Hallelujah, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Amazing grace. Hallelujah. Another hymn writer said, years I spent in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Savior was crucified. Knowing not, it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy, there was great, and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. Now my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Grace, matchless grace of God. Grace, amazing grace of God. Grace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming to my rescue. That is what grace is. Hallelujah. Another writer said, marvelous grace of our loving Lord. 
grace that exceeds our sins and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. Oh, Lord, sin and despair like the sea waves cold, threaten the soul within the loss. Grace that is greater, yes, grace untold, points to the refuge, the mighty cross. Dark is the stain that we cannot hide. What can we do to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, brighter than snow you may be today. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe. You that are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sins. You know, when you're in grace, you know you don't have to be looking around. Amen? Amen? When, when, I, when, when, I'm, when I'm let foot, I'm looking in the rear view mirror, looking on the side mirror, make sure the police is not around. But, but when I'm in grace, I don't have to look around. Because God is driving me to a land that is clean. Grace. Grace. God's grace. Hallelujah. Grace that will bring you out of shame and will not put you back in shame. Hallelujah. Grace that will bring you out of poverty but will not put you back in poverty. Grace that will bring you out of depression will not put you back in depression. Please listen to what I'm saying. Grace. The grace of God. Hallelujah. Now, the grace of God just doesn't save us. The grace of God just doesn't save us. If that's the grace you received, you're deceiving yourself. Because the grace of God, amen. Can I pick you up? It's Shante, she's not here, I can pick it up. Grace picks you up and it keeps you safe. All right. Amen. No thief can come around. Amen. 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 I know karate and judo and everything. Amen. Amen. You come out. <laughs> Grace. Amen. Grace will protect you. The devil cannot get your soul. The devil cannot get your spirit because grace is protecting you. God's grace. I miss it. I'm done. <laughs> you can't talk about grace. You, you, you just feel empty because you don't have enough word to describe what God is doing, what God has done, and what God will do. Grace, amazing grace of God. I'm thankful that I'm under his grace. So when you preach, when you go out, just remember, if you don't repent, you're not saved. And if you want to be saved, you've got to be set apart and enjoy the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us stand.